Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Broad from Deep Knowledge Investing. We work with hedge funds, private equity, family offices, registered investment advisors, and individuals like you to help you get better returns in the stock market. We are here with a super cranky version of the five things this week. Before I introduce our host, we want to wish a special happy birthday to Rob's brother, Tyler Farian. Happy birthday, Tyler. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, I am also here right now with our fantastic host, Rob Ferry, and he is the CEO and founder of Flying V Group. Uh, they are Deep Knowledge Investing's digital marketing partner. He was the one who came up with the idea for the five things. Rob, how are you this week? Great intro. And I know uh, my brother's a regular listener, so he'll be shocked. I won't let him know that that's coming. But yeah, this is a uh, exciting issue, and I think the headline really sets the tone the everyone is wrong and should admit it issues. So I'm really excited to get into this before I kind of touch on, you know, outline Gary, any, any just general uh, sentiments or tone you want to give out to everybody before we start to dive into these five points for this issue? Yeah, exactly. Two months ago, Rob and I did a version of the five things and it was called the smart people doing smart things issue. We were super positive on everyone. Like we we just, we spent the whole week talking about all the great takes that people had, the smart things they'd said and done. Uh, and it was, you know, our happy issue and you are not getting that this week. Uh, for those of you who require it, we're giving you a trigger warning. This is our super cranky issue. Uh, there was a lot of really bad behavior this week, a lot of bad decisions, a lot of stupid people saying stupid things. And look, you know what, Rob? It's okay to be wrong. All investors are wrong at times. No investor gets it right 100% of the time. But the difference between the professionals and the people who lose their, you know, all of their capital and go bankrupt is being willing to admit it when you're wrong, take the loss, take the L, and, and sell a losing position and move on. And if you're not willing to do that, bad things are going to happen. That's what we're talking about this week. So for this week, just quick highlight, we're going through Bitcoin, as I'm sure you would expect. We're talking PCE, GDP revisions. Uh, we're talking about consumer confidence, and that's starting to wane, as well as Chinese home prices circling back to that. Uh, Gary, you ready to dive in on this week's five things? Let's dive in. Point number one, Bitcoin bears are not being honest. Yeah. So <laughs> look... That was, a, that was a sinister, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Deep Knowledge Investing started recommending Bitcoin to our subscribers in 2020 when it was about 15,000. And it ran up and great, we're happy. And then it came back down, you know, and the whole crypto bust thing back down to 15,000. And we, we didn't do a thing, right? We didn't sell it because one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. The thesis was unchanged. And we always had a long-term thesis on it. Now, over the last couple of years, DKI subscribers have actually gotten returns better than what Bitcoin has done. And the way we've done that is we were buying GBTC, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which was one of the, which was the trust that converted to an ETF, an exchange traded fund. And the way we were able to make outsized returns on that is it was trading at a discount to NAV, that stands for net asset value. Basically, it was a vehicle we could use to buy Bitcoin at a discount. So rolling into 2023, so the beginning of last year, Bitcoin was just above 15,000. And it ran up through the course of the year to uh, around 40,000. And the main reason for that increase was excitement about the coming ETFs, the coming exchange traded funds. They allow people to buy Bitcoin exposure in a traditional brokerage account. It basically was a way to open up Bitcoin ownership for pension funds, mutual funds, people who weren't comfortable with self-custody or didn't want to go on the, the crypto exchanges. I understand all of that. I mean, this is stuff that I'm comfortable with. And I know, Rob, you've done things like that. And a lot of DKI subscribers, they're fine, you know, buying Bitcoin and engaging in self-custody, but not everybody is. And that's okay, right? I mean, you know, if it were my dad, I'd tell him to just buy the ETF, right? right? It's, it's just easier for some people. So we had Bitcoin running up and going into the ETF approval, which happened in the first week of January this year, mm -hmm. um, you had Bitcoin bulls like myself who own it saying, hey, look, this is going to open up Bitcoin ownership for a whole new group of people, new funds. There are trillions of dollars in pension funds. What if they start to take a 50 basis point? That's half a percent or 1% of 
position in Bitcoin because they should have some exposure. Um, and we should see Bitcoin run up on that. Now, there were bears on the other side of it saying it's priced in, which is a way of saying, look, you guys just saw Bitcoin go from roughly 15,000 to 40,000. That's because people were expecting this. And once you have the approval, you know, Bitcoin's going to crash. Okay. And so what happened was Bitcoin at the time the SEC approved it was about 44,000. It ran down to just under 40,000. That's about a 10% drawdown. If you include the momentary spike that happened right after the SEC approved it, the max, you know, the, the highest point of the year down to the bottom, it was a 16% drawdown. And, you know, we talked about this on this show. We talked about how the, um, you know, it was, it was close. Is a 10%, 16% drawdown for Bitcoin, is that really a big deal? Not really, but you know, you, we had to admit the bears had the better end of that argument. And right. if you spend a lot of time on Twitter or X, as I do, uh, you know, what we saw were all the Bitcoin bears crowing in public. We got it right. These things are a disaster. It's all going to zero. And they had a field day for a couple of weeks. Well, let's talk about what happened in the month of February. In the month of February, Bitcoin ran up 58 percent. It's right. I checked this morning. It's at 62,000 now. Yeah, 62. Yeah. 62,000. So that is a 50, almost a 60 percent increase in the course of a month. Now, if you are a Bitcoin bear and you declared victory over a 10 percent drawdown, a 16 percent drawdown over the period of a couple of weeks. All right, fine. But then be intellectually honest. And when it spends the next month running up almost 60% in your face, then there should be a mea culpa, right? Then just admit you got it wrong. And it's okay. Like there's nothing wrong with admitting you got something wrong and selling a bad position. But I, it's my Twitter timeline is just really, really quiet <laughs> with this. Maybe, maybe I unfollowed the wrong people. Maybe, maybe they're all issuing mea <laughs> culpas and I'm not seeing it. I don't know, but match it. Right. If if you have a short term thesis, then you're getting short term results. Uh, Gary, it seems like there is this groundswell movement of Bitcoin, right, and a run similar to a couple years ago. Um, is there anything that was predictable about that movement? Is it strictly tied to this ETF? Just just thoughts there, because obviously Bitcoin, from a volatility standpoint, right, we see these swings, highs and lows uh, quite often. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question, Rob. And I think there are two things that are correlated with Bitcoin and then a third thing, which is the thing I really care about. Uh, the two things that are correlated, one, with the ETF approvals, again, there are trillions of dollars in pension funds and mutual funds and people in traditional brokerage accounts. If you have like a, an RIA, a registered investment advisor. At most firms, they were not allowed to get you Bitcoin exposure. The only way to do it, a, a lot of firms wouldn't even allow people to buy the Grayscale Trust, the GBTC. Uh, some people got around it by buying you know, MSTR. Um, and you know all, all of that's fine, but the ETFs really did open up new demand. And we have seen a big run up on that. The other thing is there is a correlation between Bitcoin and global liquidity, right? And so in the US, we look at M2, which is just a way of measuring the money supply. And so if you start tracking, and, and I think Lynn Alden has done really good work on this. Lynn does great work on everything. She's somebody I respect an enormous amount. Yeah. Her, I, I, her intellect is phenomenal. Her analysis is great. Um, but you know, she's done some really good work on this tying um bitcoin its performance in dollars to global liquidity and which again the money supply and i think there's something to that now long term here's my assertion my assertion is that the thing that makes bitcoin fantastic is it becomes more and more scarce over time it's deflationary and we're basically one month away from the next halving where the reward that bitcoin miners will receive will actually be cut in half and typically, Bitcoin does run up into a halving at the halving because it basically means that the cost of mining doubles at that time. And the stock to flow ratio gets pushed more into Bitcoin, uh, into Bitcoin's favor. And so, you know, stock to flow, simply what we're talking about 
is the amount of new currency or new Bitcoins that can be added to existing supply. So right now, we have roughly 19 million Bitcoins that have been mined out of a total of 21. There are 2 million left to be mined. Um, but and, and the flow right now is about 900 coins per day. Well, in another month, that's going to be cut in half. And so that that changes this. Um, on the other side of that is fiat, which is just a fancy finance way of saying regular government currency, the way most people think about dollars or yen or euros or the British pound or pesos and you know a whole bunch of countries. Um, and what we've seen is that governments can and will print unlimited amounts of fiat. So while the Bitcoin issuance schedule every four years gets cut in half, the US Congress spends trillions and trillions of additional dollars, diluting and debasing the value of the dollar. And so, you know, if I have to sum all of this up, it, it's this simple. I can't tell you the dollar price of Bitcoin a year from now or five years from now. What I can tell you is that the purchasing power of the dollars you have in your bank account or your wherever you're storing dollars in whatever form, um, they will have the purchasing power will be lower in a year because of inflation, because there's more money being printed, more fiat being printed. Five years from now, you know, tell me what you think the price of a Big Mac or your rent or the cost to fill up your car or, you know, a, a new gadget at Best Buy, whatever it is, um, the cost of things is going to keep rising. So the purchasing power of your dollars is going to be eroded. And that's why I like having money outside the system, things like gold or Bitcoin. I uh, I hope that the Big Mac stays right where it is because that is a guilty pleasure of mine. And and uh, but I do see twenty dollar Big Macs on the horizon. I feel like <laughs> yeah, somebody you know somebody was I put this up on uh, on X or on Twitter uh, the other day. They had a they had a receipt from they bought a bacon cheeseburger, a drink, and a thing of fries at I think it was Five Guys. Yes, it was. It was more than twenty dollars. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, people were joking that, um, God, I can't remember. I think it was McDonald's. They handed out these coupons or coins that got you a, a free Big Mac. Uh, and they handed them out years ago. And, you know, the price went from like a dollar to eight dollars. And people are saying, wait a minute, you know, this is a better store of value than the dollar. <laughs> so that's too funny right so <laughs> so basically you know if for anybody who's looking for some sort of of you know financial way to avoid the decline in purchasing power of the dollar we have gold we have bitcoin and we have big mac coupons love it Point number two, Gary, uh, PCE, we're talking personal consumption expenditures. Uh, PCE accelerates a familiar refrain is coming is point and thing number two. Yeah. So let, let's give people a little background on this. The PCE stands for, as you said, Rob, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index. That's the preferred inflation measure of the Federal Reserve. And you can ask them the reasons for that, but I, I think the reason is because the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which is the item that most people, that's the index that most people look at as the proper measure of inflation, that's really a fixed basket. Uh, you know, they do play around with it every couple of years, but it's more like, you know, well, this category is this weighting, this category is this weighting, and they, you know, track prices then adjust it. And um, they always adjust it in ways that make inflation seem to be less than it is, which is another reason people don't trust it. The PCE is more closely tied to what consumers actually buy, what they spend, where they're putting their money. And so it's maybe a better measure of inflation as experienced by the consumer. And so here's what we got this month. The PCE was up 2.4%. The core PCE, that's the index, the PCE that excludes food and energy was up 2.8%. So, you know, you could say, hey, that's great. That's lower than it was before. We're down below 3%. We're approaching the 2% target, which I will continually insist is still 
too high. It should be zero. The Fed's official mandate is stable prices, not 2% of theft per year, but whatever. But here's where the numbers get a little wonky. Um, and I, Rob, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, the Sometimes people like to look at the month over month change. Mm -hmm. And the change in the PCE for the prior three months had been zero, zero, and 0.1%. And then all of a sudden, it was 0.3% this month. The core PCE was spent three months between 0.1% and 0.2%. And all of a sudden, it's up 0.4%, right? So the these indexes are accelerating. Now, for a lot of people, that might not seem like much. Like, do we care about a 0.3%? Like, you know, it's like saying, hey, this thing that costs $100, you know, okay, well, it's, it's another 30 cents. Do we care? Well, here's why you care. A 0.4% increase annualizes to 4.9%. That's two and a half times the target. And so what we're getting here is, is acceleration. And to make things even worse, uh, most of the high inflation right now is in services. And that's the part of the index that's very hard for the Federal Reserve to address. Um, and, you know, we've got a tight labor market. So there are concerns that, oh, no. You know, everybody was saying the Fed has this under control and should lower rates. Uh, they may not have it under control. You talk about uh, risk that isn't priced into these current indexes, Gary, a little bit. Um, as a as an investor, just personally, I mean, what is there anything that we need to be doing to counteract that or to be ready for that risk once it is actually priced into these indexes, especially saying what you're saying to me right now in terms of the spike that we saw just over these last last uh, these last period. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that for a second. Uh, what we saw in at the beginning of 2022 and for much of that year was the market plummeted. It went down you know, roughly 30 percent, depending on which index you're looking at. And the reason for that is because the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates. Okay, well, you know, we understand that. You have a higher discount rate. And so the value of future cash flows or future dividends from the companies that you own is lower on a present value basis. And where we really saw stocks getting hammered was uh, in the technology sector because high growth companies where you're projecting a lot of future growth. They're basically high duration assets. And that's just a fancy way of saying a lot of their cash flow is going to come in future years. Well, as you apply a higher discount rate to that, the value, the present value of those cash flows gets really hammered. And so we saw the tech stocks get crushed. And one of the reasons why stocks started to recover at the end of 2022 and through all of 2023 were expectations that the Federal Reserve was about to pivot and start to lower interest rates. Okay, you know, fair enough. That sounds fine. But we were rolling into December last year, and people thought the first Federal Reserve rate decrease would take place in January. And if it wasn't January, it was going to be March, and we were going to get six decreases this year. By the way, these people were all saying the same thing last year and they were wrong all of last year, right? These same people all of 2023 were saying, you're going to see the Federal Reserve pivot and reduce rates. That didn't happen. Now, you know, they were expecting the first rate decrease to happen in January. That didn't happen. They pushed out to March after some of the recent events we've had, which we've been talking about in the five things. Now people are saying, OK, well, you know, maybe we get the first rate decrease in June and instead of six, we get three. And again, you know, what what's the title of this one? Uh, sorry, of this version of the five things. It It is everyone's wrong and should admit it issue. <laughs> and instead of admitting it, these people, they just keep. It, it's sort of like saying, you know, the, we're, we're, the, the aliens are coming to take us away on Monday. All right. Well, it's a Tuesday. Wednesday, at some point, just admit that this isn't happening. Um, and But what's happened is even though these expectations for rate decreases have been pushed back and lowered, and again, people thought it would happen in 2023, didn't. They thought it would happen in January, didn't. Now they're, okay, halfway through 2024, all right, but we now have market indexes at all time highs with you know Powell making it crystal clear higher for longer. And Rob, I don't know if you saw, but this week there was even talk that the Federal Reserve could increase rates again. Now, I don't think that's about to happen, 
but we've gone from why haven't they reduced rates? Uh, you know, six rate reductions are coming. Okay, three rate reductions are coming. Oh, well, maybe they'll increase rates. But while this is happening, the market is making all time highs. Now, part of that is NVIDIA. Okay, you know, great. And a couple of other, you know, mega cap tech stocks that in fairness have been performing really well on a fundamental basis. But, you know, you've got higher for longer. You have increasing inflation here if you're looking at the the short-term PCE. And, you know, maybe the market isn't, hasn't incorporated that yet. People might want to acknowledge the macro environment uh, that, and, and it's, it's not priced in at the moment. Great analysis there, Gary. Appreciate that. Moving to thing three, talking GDP, GDP revised down. We had an adjustment there. Congress set on destroying more value. Great, yeah. great headline that every American should be really happy about. <laughs> yeah, right. So I, uh, yeah, if, if we have to sum this one up, it, it is that the GDP is a fake number uh, and we have a government set on destroying as much of it as possible. Congratulations. This is not so great. But again, you know, we told you it was going to be a super cranky version of the five things of people doing, you know, unwise things. Um, so look, one of the things we've talked about a lot at DKI is the tendency of government agencies to report favorable numbers on the announcement day when everybody's looking, and then a month or two later when no one's paying attention, they revise them in an unfavorable direction. Um, and we just got that again. You know, with fourth quarter GDP, it was revised down from 3.3% to 3.2%. Now, does that matter? Nope, it doesn't. I don't really care. And, you know, anybody who's looking at this, I, I will assure you that the government is not capable of measuring economic activity in a country this size to within a tenth of a percentage point. So why does this matter? The key thing here is that the GDP is now a completely faked number. Government spending is additive to GDP, whether it produces value or not. And, you know, the old example is you could pay half the country to dig holes, the other half to fill up those holes. You've created nothing of value, but everybody who's digging holes and who's filling holes when they get paid by the government, that adds to GDP. So, it, you know, it's an old example, but it's a good one because it shows how GDP can be increased by government spending without creating any value. Now, what's happening right now is Congress is overspending by two to three trillion dollars a year. There have been a ton of stories in the press over the last week on how we are adding a trillion dollars of debt every 90 to 100 days, right? Okay, that is a massive amount. It's, we're way past $2 trillion of overspending here. Um, but all of that spending gets added to GDP. And so, you know, basically our government has decided to fund itself through money printing and additional debt instead of taxes. And that gives the incorrect appearance that everything is free, right? We can have guns, butter, and everything else, right? Whatever we want. Uh, all we have to do is just print more dollars. So what we're basically doing is we are paying for excessive spending through inflation. And, and so we're looking at these huge increases in debt and this recent big increase in GDP and saying, wait a minute, this is fake. This isn't, this isn't accurate. Um, and basically the Congress is buying favorable GDP numbers at the cost of your loss of spending power. Right. So when you go next month or next quarter to buy something, you say, oh, my God, how are prices up again? This is how we're paying for government overspending and the high GDP, which, again, is fake. I know uh, the answer to this question will not be simple, but as as an American consumer, right, and I sure, sure I voice the same sentiments of a lot of viewers, it's like, We've been talking about inflation for what seems like a long time, right? Since we've even started working together, Gary. It's like, when does it stop, right? When when do we see things curbed or when do we get it back? Is there even a route, right? I was looking at uh, car insurance the other day up for renewal, oh, $2,000 yeah. for six months on my policy for this upcoming year, right? But so I guess, yeah, just when does it stop or or what is the path to get us out? Because it just seems like, a spiraling, spiraling, spiraling um, case. And, and we just keep going further and further down the rabbit hole. 
Yeah. So Rob, unless you're driving a million dollar Ferrari at 200 miles an hour, that's $4,000 a year seems like a lot for car insurance. So yeah, I actually, uh, normally the car insurance, it's, Hey, that's a line. I, you know, you got to account for it. It was one that caught my eye. Um, good buddy of mine's, uh, my broker and sent me a video kind of explaining these prices that are now getting baked in that hadn't got baked in, in 2000, 2001 and so forth when insurance premiums were lower because not as many people were driving. Obviously we had the, uh, stimulus coming out right so yeah i'm still looking into that a little bit more but it did shock me and it made me made me pause <laughs> yeah my home insurance uh those prices are up 20 percent compounded for each of the last two or three years and i don't even drive my house right so <laughs> I, I i can't speed in it um but yeah it's it's a huge problem and by the way you know when you look at the insurance aspects of the cpi we're not, we're not looking at 20% compounded. These num Again, these numbers are a lie, but you know, Rob, you're asking the right question, which is when does it get better? And I have really bad news. Again, here's your trigger warning. Everyone, this is your super cranky version of the five things. Um, it's actually going to get worse. And here's why we had, we had our intern, Andrew Brown is doing a great job from the university of Tennessee, put together a chart this week. And let me tell you what's going on. And I'm eyeballing this because I'm looking at a chart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is, you know, these numbers aren't exact, but the second quarter of 2023, we had GDP growth of about $1.5 trillion. Okay. That's pretty good. But increase in government debt, that was about $1.8 trillion. There's a trend here. The following quarter, third quarter. GDP growth of about 1.6 trillion. Again, I'm eyeballing a chart. It's not exactly yep. right. Government debt growth of about 2.3 trillion. And then this last quarter, GDP growth of about 1.5 trillion, which itself is a respectable number, but government debt up more than $2.5 trillion. And so that's your government spending. And basically you have to draw one of two conclusions and neither one is a pleasant one. The first conclusion, which is the one that I agree with, is that a dollar of government spending produces much less than a dollar worth of GDP, of actual economic growth. So every time the government's spending money, they are wasting money, they're destroying value because that's what we see. If you have government debt up by 2.5 trillion and produce $1.5 trillion of GDP growth, then what that tells you is that the government is destroying value. And it's true. All they're doing is pulling demand forward, right? This is the equivalent of living off of massive amounts of credit card debt and pretending like you'll never go bankrupt and saying, look, I made money. You didn't make money. You just pulled forward demand and spending. Uh, the other conclusion that you could draw, if you're very enthusiastic about government spending, and there are people who are, uh, you know, I don't agree with them, but they're entitled to their opinion. Uh, they might say, no, 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 government spending produces tons of value and, you know, there's a multiplier and, you know, there are people who say a dollar of government spending produces $2 of GDP growth uh, to or GDP value. Okay, fine. Let's accept that. Here's what we have. We have an increase last quarter of 2.5, 2.6 trillion dollars of debt. Let's just round down 2.5. So what we should have seen if those people are right is somewhere between 2.5 and $5 trillion of economic growth. We got $1.5 trillion of economic growth. So for the people who are- Completely adverse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for the people who are enthusiastic about government spending, then the only conclusion that you can draw is that the private economy is in a massive recession producing trillions of dollars of negative growth, mm. right? The That the private sector- is contracting by trillions of dollars and the GDP in the real non-government economy is collapsing. Now, if it, so you either have to accept the fact that our government is wasting money and going to continue doing so at an accelerating pace, in which case, Rob, the inflation is going to get worse, not better, or you have to conclude that we are in a massive, massive, massive recession and huge amounts of government spending funded by debt are supporting it. Either way, it's not a good outcome here. No doubt. Thing number four, Gary, we're moving to consumer confidence. And our headline is consumer confidence is a huge miss. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Uh, what? Finally. What, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> I know. You know what, what these economists do is they go, they talk to people and they ask them how they're feeling about the economy and consumer confidence last month was 111, which, you know, that's, a, you don't need to, to pull long-term charts. I will tell you that's, that's a pretty good number, right? That's, that's people being pretty confident. And, um, you know, Rob, one of the things we've talked about a lot on the five things is that uh, consumer confidence has not only been high, consumer spending has been through the roof high. People have been spending huge amounts of money. And we've been shocked month after month at these really strong retail sales numbers. Now, what we saw last month, and we talked about it on the five things, was we saw a reversal. The manufacturing numbers got better, but the consumer spending numbers actually turned negative. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um now, somehow economists looked at that and they projected uh, an expected consumer confidence number rising from the 111 we just told you about to 115 for the month, which is a pretty big increase. Instead, we got 107. Now, for people who don't follow this stuff on a regular basis, okay, eight points off. Is that really a big deal? Is that a big... Yeah, it's a huge, huge miss. These You don't see misses of this size. I, I haven't run the numbers on it myself. I was reading, there were other people uh, who, you know, did the statistical analysis. They said, that's a six Sigma miss. I assure you that's the kind of thing you should not expect to see in your lifetime. Um, that is an enormous miss. And so, you know, one, I, I'm not sure where these economists are, are getting the numbers, but you, you shouldn't miss by this month, but two, sorry, by this much, but also it, you'd have to start drawing the conclusion that the consumer is starting to face more difficulty than people thought. Again, you know, the, you see all these articles in the newspaper every week, uh, you know, the economy's in great shape. Why are people in a bad mood? Right. And the implication from the New York times or CNN or other very pro establishment, pro government media outlets is that, you know, the government is right. And the consumer is right. The American people are wrong for not feeling like the economy is great. Well, maybe it's not great for them. Maybe it's great for the government because they're spending a lot and manufacturing good GDP numbers. Uh, but maybe, you know, people aren't doing so well in their homes. And when they sit down at their dinner table to go through their monthly expenses, their bills, maybe things aren't so good. And this is what you'd expect to see on this. And, you know, my suggestion to the legacy media is maybe start to get to know people in the real economy instead of reporting the government you know, the, the government narrative, which is everything's terrific. Uh, elections coming up, obviously, at the end of this year. I mean, what is the White House's focus going to be? A long time from, you know, March until November now. But I mean, what will their focus be over these next six, seven months? Yeah. So, you know, Rob, here's the thing. Americans spend, you know, three and a half years out of every four year election cycle discussing and debating all kinds of issues, uh -huh. economic issues, social issues, medical issues, immigration issues. Um, and, you know, we're not, you know, here at DKI, it's, it's not our job to take a position on any of that. It's our job is to help you make more money. Right. And then however you want to spend that money, whatever causes you want to support, that's your business. We're just here to help people. Um, but we're, what we see people doing reliably, whether they're happy or unhappy with all of these issues that we talked about, people tend to vote on the economy. And so there were a lot of people this week looking at this consumer confidence number and saying, this is a disaster for the White House. Because you can really count on Americans reliably to blame the party or person in the White House for a bad economy and switch horses. Mm -hmm. And so people are saying, oh, my God, you know, consumer confidence falling off a cliff, consumer spending starting to come down, inflation starting to go up. This is a disaster for the White House. And, you know, they should start packing their bags. And if this were September or October, I would agree with them. Right. Generally, bad economic news, bad consumer confidence, people not feeling good about their their financial health. That's a great way to replace the party in the White House. With that said, you know, we're a, we're a day into March, two days into March at this point. Um, 
there's a lot of time between now and November. I, this week's news is not good for the White House, but there's a lot that's going to happen between now and the November elections. I don't know that I'd be drawing robust conclusions from th this data was significant, but it's not robust yet. Let's see what happens to this trend over the next four or five months before we start um, projecting political conclusions and, uh, and, you know, uh, starting to bet on who's going to be in the White House a year from now. Wrapping up this week, again, the everyone is wrong and should admit it issue. I think we need, it might be one of my all-time favorite uh, titles. So I think we may need to start keeping track of that for sure. Uh, thing number five, Gary, Chinese housing prices continue to fall. I believe we spoke about this three, four months ago, might've been, um, but yeah, we have an update there. Yeah, we, we did. And you know what? One of the things that's amazing, and we just spent, Rob, half of this version of the five things criticizing the U.S. government for its management of the economy uh, and for it being too large a part of the economy. Well, guess what? That that situation is magnified in a place like China, where there really is no private economy, right? The government has a much greater uh amount of control. And here, you know, in the US, we have an issue with corporatism where our large companies are in bed with the government. And I, I think that's a problem. That's not great for anybody. But in China, they have SOEs, state owned enterprises, right? The government doesn't influence these companies, the government controls them. <laughs> and one of the issues in China, because of this, is the government has told the banks you will lend and they've told the property developers you will build and these people are all um building to try to meet their government quotas so there's been a huge amount of overbuilding the chinese economy has not been great the economic numbers just like you know i've been complaining about the numbers here in the us but if you're in china the numbers there are pretty bad and by the way their numbers are faked too the reality in china is always worse than what they report <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's not the U.S. government that has any um, monopoly on right. bad behavior, bad data, or too much control. But in China, it's worse. And part of that is because their banking sector is over leveraged. Their property developers don't actually have enough money to complete the housing that they've taken deposits for. So, like, try to imagine this. Imagine putting a deposit down for a house your builder says, okay, well, you know, we're building the apartment building. You'll have your apartment that you've partially paid for in a couple of years. And then they don't have the money, right? There's And there's no way to recover. Um, and so all of this is, is crashing property prices in an over leveraged sector. Um, the property, uh, the I want to say producers, right? But the builders, they're yeah. over leveraged. The banks are over leveraged. The government is controlling this. And they built a whole bunch of apartments that people can no longer afford. So property prices are plummeting. And the big deal there is property is really the way many Chinese people store their wealth. Uh, just like, you know, here in the US, it's a problem when people see the stock market drop and their 401ks drop or their IRA accounts drop. Uh, in China, they store their wealth in property. And so this is a huge problem for them. Uh, with Chinese government control, Gary, and obviously the housing market here in, in the US, a very popular uh, discussion point quite often. Is there any correlation between what's happening in the Chinese housing market and potentially the American housing market at all? I don't think so. I think China is oversupplied. Um and going into a weak economy. And again, this is really the way they store wealth. And it's anecdotal. But, mm -hmm. you know, Rob, one of the things we see are, you know, Chinese families going into multi-generational debt to buy sons apartments, because right. without that, their marriage prospects are nil and none. And so entire families, parents and grandparents are going into debt because without it, their sons won't be able to to get married. And, you know, one of the things that China had with their one child policy, which lasted for decades, is they have a culture that has a strong preference for sons. And so the Chinese uh, citizens practice sex selective abortions for years and years and years. And so roughly the number of marriage age men 
is about 30% larger than the number of marriage age women in China. And so if you are a, a Chinese man, 30% of Chinese men have no hope of finding a Chinese wife. They just don't have enough, they don't have enough young women to pair with the men. And so, you know, families are desperately buying property because without that, these men will be part of the 30% that don't get married, don't have kids, will be excluded from having families unless they leave the country. And so that's what's going on there. Here in the US, um, you know, there are people who argue we're, we have too much housing. There are other people who argue we have too little housing. I think we've had, uh, because in the US, we have a tendency toward smaller household size, um, we need more households. And so there, there can be an argument made that we actually should be adding uh, housing units here in the U.S. But what's really been driving the U.S. property market for years and years have been interest rates. And the Federal Reserve, after the 2008 financial crisis, kept interest rates far too low for far too long. That made housing appear inexpensive. People were seeing huge increases in asset prices. That's typical of... Um, economies where interest rates are too low, you end up with asset bubbles. And then what we've seen is we should have seen a decrease in housing prices with higher interest rates over the last couple of years. And the reason that hasn't happened is because no one wants to sell a house and get a seven or 8% mortgage if they have a 3% mortgage now. And so that's kept, um, that's kept properties off the market. So I actually think both countries have issues in the housing sector. They have affordability issues, but I think the drivers on both sides, uh, the societal drivers and the financial drivers are just very different. And uh, our housing market may be heading the same direction as the Chinese housing market in terms of pricing, but I think it's for different reasons. Great stuff, Gary. Uh, awesome edition of The Five Things. As always, thank you for your time and putting all this information together. Uh, this week's edition was the everyone is wrong and should admit it issue. Again, we really thank you for your support and watching and spending your time with us. If you wouldn't mind, please give us a like or a comment question. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel would be uh, greatly appreciated so we can continue to pump out this great content. Uh, be sure to check out our website at deepknowledgeinvesting.com. You can sign up for a free subscription. Uh, we'll deliver this content and information to you directly uh, in your email. And then as always, would love if you would consider a premium subscription for full access to current recommendations, buys, sells, et cetera, as Gary helps us to navigate the market. Uh, Gary, any final closing thoughts? No, th Rob, first of all, thanks for doing this with me so early on a Sunday morning. I appreciate yeah, great, it. Great way to start. Great yeah. way. It's not football season, so it's perfectly, I got nothing to do on Sunday mornings anymore. For, who does, right? <laughs> why, why, why do anything? Um, but anyway, for everyone watching this, thank you. We appreciate your time. We know how valuable it is. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the last piece of, um, of counsel I'd have for people is, you know, we make an effort to be right about things. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to make a mistake. Just acknowledge it. Don't double down on a bad decision. That's that's what I have. And that, by the way, that will work in your personal life and your investing <laughs> life. It's just a good way to go through life. I agree. I agree. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for watching. Gary, thanks again for your time. All right. See you guys next week.